Banjo-Kazooie is one of the greatest 3D platformers of all time. There's probably a very small population that would ever argue otherwise. Rare took everything that they saw Mario 64 succeed with and improved upon it, creating a tight-knitted, charming, and iconic adventure. Follow that up with a highly ambitious sequel that was massive with interconnected worlds and expanding upon the cast, gameplay, lore, and story we got in the first game. Everything about that sounds incredible. So why are people online bashing it? Here we go again, guys. I'm Jiggy Lookback, and I'm a Banjo-Tooie Defender. Let's head back to 1998. The idea for a sequel to Banjo-Kazooie was actually in talks before Kazooie was even officially released, thanks to the mythical stop and swap plan. For those who don't know, this was an idea to be able to utilize the fact that Nintendo 64 could hold memory in it of a game that recently was yanked out, and you'd slam the next game in and boom, you could unlock items from one game to the other. This was even meant to be across other rare titles, but Nintendo made hardware revisions that reduced the time the memory is stored on the console, so they said, yeah, please don't do that. But nevertheless, Tui was in the back of the team's minds. Lots of ideas that didn't see fruition were being planned for the sequel. In an interview on NintendoLife.com, director Greg Mails said that Tui was made to be a darker second act, and stated, We didn't want to do the same thing again as the first game, and we wanted to surprise players. I don't think anyone would have expected us to kill off one of the main supporting characters, and I can remember us laughing when we plotted Bottle's downfall. So already, there was a massive tonal shift planned, and in addition to this, in the same interview, he said he wanted Tui to be more of an adventure and less of a platformer. The team was also influenced by the success of The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time and Metal Gear Solid, which showed that audiences are wanting more mature games. Tui upon release received generally pretty positive reviews, with a few slightly less favorable, but not bad scores. Several comments capture the sentiment at the time, with IGN saying, The Bear and Bird are back, and better than ever. 3D platforming has been better, never. Jay Sonneville wrote a review on GameFAQ saying, If you own an N64, you must buy this game. So what happened? Why has this game now garnered a negative reputation nowadays? Well, there are a few reasons, and let's take a look. Not only did I scour the internet, but I also took to Twitter and got another amazing response from you guys. One thing I've read is people don't like the dark atmosphere. The Banjo-Kazooie world was bright, colorful, and happy with a light-hearted tale. They clearly diverted from that, no question. But even though this game was a darker tone, there still is a lot of heart and charm here. Maybe even more so than the original. We definitely get way more details and backgrounds to each character. Grunty has more than one sister, and they also hate her rhyming. Klungo hates his job and is married? Bottles isn't only married, but has multiple children, who like Donkey Kong and Jet Force Gemini. We're introduced to Humble Wumbo, who's sort of a rival to Mumbo Jumbo, who takes on a more prominent role in this game, being playable. And even meet my papa, Master Jiggy Wiggy. That's a little Jiggy look back lore for you. He tells you to subscribe, by the way. This world, though, taking a darker, somber tone, even reflected on the destroyed and battered Spiral Mountain with a sad version of our previously happy theme, still gives us moments of joy and a level of charm the first game didn't even try to deliver on. It may be slightly more mature, but we're still looking at a talking bear fighting a witch here at the end of the day. The dark atmosphere isn't really that dark, it's just a tonal shift. And if you prefer Kazooie's tone, that's totally okay, but honestly, I think the expanded world and building upon all these characters just makes Tui feel special. In my further scouring of the internet, one of the most highly voiced comments I see in the videos and online forums is backtracking. There's no way around this, Banjo-Tooie does have a lot of backtracking. I think the issue really doesn't stem from the idea of backtracking, but it stems from the fact that backtracking takes place between worlds in the game. Tooie is massive. The Isle of Hags is one ginormous interconnected world filled with characters both familiar and new. You'll find yourself running a lot. So much so, the game has offered several ways to traverse through worlds. One is the hub world mole hills that lets you go between areas of the hub, another is warp pads within levels themselves, the train you fix in Glitter Gulch Mine, and some worlds just connect via random exits and rooms. That's four different methods to get to different worlds. You could be in Myhem Temple and go all the way to Pterodactyland and then go to Witchy World without ever entering the hub world. 
This in and of itself is actually really cool and well thought out. The thing people don't like though is the game pushes you to do quests like heal the sick dinosaur by separating Banjo and Kazooie, packing it up in your pack, putting it on the train, taking the train to a specific spot, swapping to Mumbo and using a Mumbo pad to magically heal them, and then take the train back to deliver it back where you got it. Tui is loaded with things like that. This seems to be a real issue for people, but I think perhaps this is because people were used to Banjo Kazooie which focused more on 3D platforming in an enclosed one-off level that is densely packed, which as as I stated earlier, the team was going for more of an adventure feel rather than a platforming feel. Don't get me wrong, the game is still a platformer, however, to make these worlds feel alive and connected as one big piece, it would involve missions like that. Sure, they could not be as tedious as the baby dinosaur example, but I don't think they all are. Like saving Gobi, for instance. You release him in Witchy World from his cage and then see him again in Hailfire Peaks where you can drain the water from him to cool the train engine off. Boom, you're done. Not very tedious at all. This is a game I feel the backtracking actually adds value to the world. If I had to offer a suggestion for helping with this, it would probably be the ability to separate Banjo and Kazooie without having to find the pads to do so, and perhaps adding a quick return feature where Kazooie flies back into your pack. It's just an idea. Another complaint I've heard is frame dips, and this is something I completely understand. People of today have the opportunity to play the 360 version, and hopefully the Switch Online version soon? Question mark? which fixes the performance issues. The reality is this game can chug sometimes. There were so many occasions where you'd be simply running and the frames would dip down to probably like 10 or 12, maybe lower, I'm not sure. The game generally runs at about 21 frames per second, which is still pretty low. The good? The worlds are huge and the characters have a lot of detail in them. The lighting system in the game is great. Just look at how you grab a jiggy and it lights you up as it spins around you. Plus, this is the first game I've ever played where I was blown away. My shadow looked like my shadow. Before, in tons of games, it was just a black circle. I remember the moment I saw this as a kid and being impressed. But all of that great stuff came at the cost of frame rate dips. This is arguably one of the best looking N64 titles, but also one of the poorest running ones. However, upon replaying this game, what initially was a noticeable frustration somehow became less noticeable as I play. It's something your brain just seems to stop caring about as you get further into the game. That's not to say the performance is good, it's just to say it doesn't stop you from playing and enjoying this game on the N64. This is a sentiment that I thought I was alone in, but I found out I shared the same sentiment as an IGN reviewer back in the day. And they said, Banjo Tooie had me hooked from the start. Sure, one of the first things I said was, Gah, do I have to collect frame rates in this? But assuredly, it became easier to overlook. I'm not sure why that is, but it just is. People who play this on the 360 will not have the frame rate issues and it will be stable. But I still challenge you to go play the 64 version as it's still the definitive one. Rare was so on point with development that cutscenes and music even accounted for the frame dips. Pretty cool. Plus, I believe playing this game with the N64 controller is just the way to go. It just feels right. I also hear online people dislike the minigames, but to be honest, I feel this is unwarranted. All of Kazooie's minigames work well. I promise this isn't a beaver bother situation. You have minigames like Saucer Peril in Witchy World where you fly a flying saucer shooting at targets. It's simple and not frustrating at all, and it also gives you an alternate view of Witchy World. And then you have games in an FPS style where Banjo utilizes Kazooie like a gun, and I think these are hilarious. And to top it all off, they made a fun multiplayer mode out of it. What's not to like? The last complaint I commonly hear is about the giant worlds and how they're empty. Mayhem Temple, the first world of the game, shows us what was once a collectathon is no longer. Notes are bundled up and barely are used as, hey, walk over here and navigation tools. In fact, eggs are also bundled up, though we get lots of different egg types. Jiggies are still the main collectibles and the world offers tons of ways to collect them. This is by no means a collect tons of stuff game, though there is some stuff to collect. I actually think having more would have helped it, where people complained about DK64 having too much, I think Tui had a little too little. On the flip side of that, I wouldn't say these worlds are empty. This sentiment I think comes by comparison to Kazooie, which is smaller and densely packed. They wanted to make Tui an adventure, and they succeeded. Think about it. Ocarina of Time, which the team said they were directly inspired by, had you ride upon a on Hyrule Fields. It's a big, empty space. The only reason Banjo gets flack is because he came from Kazooie, which was more of a collectathon and densely packed. You don't hear anyone really complain about Ocarina of Time. I also think the enemies, characters, and different methods of travel negate most of that complaint. Pterodactyland is one I hear as being particularly empty, and to be honest, I just don't see it. I really like that level. It's got just enough enemies and interesting things happening. Plus, you can turn into a giant T-Rex and go smashing all your enemies. 
or you can turn into a baby one and go talk to them and have a little chat. Now that we've discussed some of the negatives, I want to bring up some of the things that I think Tui absolutely shines in. The gameplay. Oh my gosh, that sweet, sweet gameplay. Tui is everything you liked about Kazooie dialed up to 11. Your movement feels overall better and less clunky. I've described it before in previous videos as fluid. And yeah, that's it. It's more fluid. Even things like swimming, they improved to perfection and made you faster. The role offers way more precise control, and I love that they added Kazooie over you so it feels like they practiced. And even some new mechanics with first-person egg-aiming, which creates nice puzzle-solving moments with targets and moves like the build drill to drill through rocks add just a little bit more to your already stellar moveset from Kazooie. Follow that up with different items in addition to the boots and trainers from the first game, you get the spring shoes and suction cup shoes, plus a whole host of egg types that largely are just for fun, only a few instances where you have to use the different types. All of this, plus expanding upon the character lore, giving us tons of super memorable boss fights, which is something that was lacking in Kazooie. Every boss was unique and different, with Klungo really being the only repeat, minus the dragons and Hailfire Peaks, and Tui gives us some of the best music in a video game. It proudly continues Kazooie's legacy and gives us banger after banger. Jinjo Village regularly repeats in my head for no reason. I should also add that this is another situation of not having to collect it all. Kazooie was pretty tight with how you needed to collect the vast majority of jiggies and notes, but Tui gives you a good buffer. Notes are used for acquiring upgrades from Jam Jars, Bottle's Cousin, and they're bunched in groups so it's easy to get a bunch real quick. And the amount of jiggies in the game amounts to 90, and you need to collect only 70 to actually beat the game. All in all, the hate for Tui again seems to be more of a new sentiment. A comment in my Defending DK64 video made a good point. Part of the charm of these games is the sense of childlike wonder and exploration. You weren't meant to know where everything is and had to search for it. With the internet and walkthroughs everywhere, we've lost that special piece. But I gotta say, if you're on the fence about playing Banjo-Tooie, don't be. Banjo-Tooie is a good game. This is my favorite N64 game of all time, and in my eyes, Banjo-Tooie only has one fatal flaw. Mother if you want to see an in-depth analysis and review of every element of Tui level by level, go take a look at my analyzing everything about Banjo Tui video. And please take a minute to drop a like in this video, it helps me spread the love of this game. Well that's all I have for you. Until next time, have a good one. Jiggy look back!